Good afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon and welcome to this edition of our sports show. As you sports show, as you know, we've been previewing and airing for the last month or so about a special feature we're doing, Global Rugby uh, Legends. Uh, as you know, rugby is so anonymous uh, in Ireland, especially where we come from in the Munster region, the heart of uh, rugby here in this part of Ireland. Uh, we're delighted to be speaking to some of the greats of rugby uh, throughout the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, countries from Wales, Scotland, England, our own Ireland, Australia, South Africa and New Zealand. I'm delighted this evening to be joined by a World Cup winner, a two-time World Rugby uh, World Cup finalist at MBE, a four-time winner of the English, five-time winner of the English uh, Premier uh, League Rugby Union League. He won a four in a row uh, with the Leicester Tigers. Uh, 71 appearances for his country, 45 points at 2005 British, uh, Irish and Lion as well. Uh, the one and only uh, Lewis Moody. Uh, Lewis, uh, first of all, a pleasure to have you uh, this evening, uh, sir. And uh, Lewis, growing up for you, I know you come from England, an awful lot. Were you a pronounced athlete? Uh, was soccer an option for you? Was basketball, was cricket an option for you? Growing up, were you always immersed uh, as a young age, as a teenage boy in rugby? And was rugby always the path for you if you're ever going to take a sporting one? Well, mate, firstly, Jim, good to see you and great to be on. Um, well, do you know what? I, I, I came, I was going to say I met rugby at the age of five, which is, I suppose, sort of what happened. One of my uh, one of my mum's uh, mate's sons was looking for someone to go go down the local rugby club with him. And uh, and I I happened to be that person at the age of five, and uh, and rugby was full contact then, and and it was always a part of the game that I loved, and and it suddenly it just gave me an introduction in the mud and the wet and the rain, um, of piling into people from from a young age was something that I was going to enjoy immensely, um, and and that was it. But I did. I played all other sports, not football. I was absolutely village at football. Okay. <laughs> um, they stuck me in goal sometimes just because I was big, I think, and could catch. I couldn't kick, sadly, um, as anyone that saw me play rugby would uh, bear witness to. But uh, but athletics, so county javelin, and uh, I did a bit of first-team cricket as well. So uh, yeah. that was me. And Lewis, I know, growing, I know growing up as rugby at a young age doing the research, you actually played in centre and full-back as well before actually becoming a flanker. So being trust in the front sort of role in terms of uh, rugby growing up as a young age were you out as a, a full back as a centre because of your speed and your ability to dodge and duck uh, defenders and did that uh, at first you or were you very much learned all the positions of rugby at a young age that's a great question yeah I mean I only ever played literally I played centre from the age of five to well there would have been like nine or something right when positions started coming in until uh, the year before I turned pro, pretty much. Um, but I did mix through. I did play a little bit of fullback. I, I got moved into the second row, which I absolutely detested. Um, and then uh, I actually got moved. It was a brilliant piece of, um, of decision-making by a former school coach of mine, Brian Welford, who was on the, on the divisional coaching panel when uh, I went for a Midland trial. And I tried and failed to get into the county uh, under 16s, was the under 14s, I can't remember now. But um, during a, another trial, he moved me from uh, centre to, to back row. And during the course of that trial, it was like a sort of, it was like an epiphany. I think they realised that I was just going to be, you know, I was going to be a very try hard, uh, hard ball carrying big tackling centre, maybe not with enough skill <laughs> to, uh, to to make a to make a decent professional career. So they moved me and that was it. And I was there, you know, so at 17, I was moved into the back row and uh, I felt I absolutely fell in love with it straight away. You know, you got to chase the ball, you got to pile into the centres and the fly half. So uh, I would I would say that that upbringing in the backs, though, really benefited my my game in the back row for sure. And uh, I was reading here, I'm doing my research about you, Lewis, the impact of meeting Ed Houston on the Leicester Tigers and that U team uh, sort of, he sort of propelled you in, in terms of your guidance to the next level. And you were the youngest uh, debut uh, ever in terms of Leicester Tigers until Ben Young surpassed that mark at age 18 years and 94 days. Uh, uh, how was, much was that in terms of your development with Ed, uh, with the U team and Leicester Tigers that you were able to come on in terms of uh, make a, your professional debut at only 18 years of age? 
Well, a huge man. As you, you know, Jim, I, I don't actually know who uh, who Ed is or who you're referring to there, but oh. maybe that's maybe that's a typo in the book. So the guy that was most uh, prominent for my youth career was uh, was a chap called Ian Dosser Smith. So he was my okay. school first team coach, and uh, and he was also um, the coach at Tigers at the time. And he gave me the break when I left school, um, the summer of. 96 and said mate go go down to the Tigers see how you get on as a as a fresh-faced fairly skinny 18 year old schoolboy, um and and that was it you know I I went into a hard-nosed Leicester Tigers team forwards pack that include the likes of Dean Richards and you know uh, Martin Johnson Neil back Graham Roundtree Darren Garforth guys that I'd sat in the stands only months before watching and all of a sudden I was I was treading the same training ground and, and trying not to get you know too beaten up <laughs> so it was you know, and it was, you know, the guys like Dossa and Dossa Smith who were so passionate about Leicester, you know, Irish rugby is a passionate place to go and play and and, and Leicester is very similar. You know, it's uh, it's steeped in history. The the guys that ran the club back then had played, you know, whether it was the kit man and Cliff Shepherd, um, Dossa, who was, you know, 300 games to the club at back row, um, Pete Wheeler, um, Pete Tom, they'd all played and, you know, Lions and various other things. They were running the club at the higher level. So it was really a family. It felt like a family. And when you're immersed in that for the first time as a young man, it's quite daunting. Um, but uh, but having people like like Dossa and, and other youth team coaches around that were prepared to give you a step and a bit of encouragement, um, you know, pick me up if you're feeling down, but uh, but just some positive energy to push you in the right direction and to make you feel like you could do it. Um, I felt really lucky that, that I fell in, into that club and and at the time that I did with so many incredible players around, I mean, it was just, you know, that bit was just luck and timing really to, to be in a squad with with so many remarkable players like Martin Johnson and Neil Back and, you know, Pat Howard and, and the international players. I think you're talking to Joel Stransky, who was, you know, yeah. in my second season came over as the fly half, who I'd watched as a kid at school winning a World Cup. I was like... yeah. This is this is mental, and Fritz van Heerden, who was in the same team as Joel, um, so yeah, that was a really cool place to to grow up as a young man and to to learn your rugby. And I suppose, Lewis, before I bring you on to England, that all conquering Leicester Tigers team, four in a row, nineteen ninety nine to zero two. Obviously, then two Heineken Cup finals. You played a big part in two thousand one. Played a huge part in two thousand and two. They're probably revered as one of the great uh, English rugby sides of the past uh, two or three uh, decades. Uh, and did you feel almost invincible when you went out when you played everyone uh, in terms of? The French sides, the renowned Irish side. He, 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 he almost had this, uh, the Arsenal team of the Invincibles, you know, uh, uh, about you in terms of when you went out. You just felt it. You almost felt that you looked the opponent in the eye that you hadn't beat before he even got onto the field. I think you nailed it there, Jim. That's exactly how we felt. You know, um, at home, we were unbeaten for four years. And, uh, you know, that was quite remarkable when you think about it. You know, we didn't lose a game at home for four years. It became a complete fortress. Um, and, and it all started really when, you know, Bob Dwyer sort of came in 96, the Aussie World Cup winning coach. Um, he brought over some international players. He didn't quite um, get the momentum he wanted in terms of, the success on the field, but he really professionalised Leicester Tigers as a club. You know, he changed the mentality. He brought in all the strength and conditioning elements. You know, rugby was really still amateur in 96. You know, it was that first sort of professional turning point and the next few years were a real learning curve. And, and he helped really move it forward. And then Dean Richards and John Wells, who I'd played with in my first two seasons, then became the coach in 98. And it just seemed to be on a constant trajectory of success from that moment. You know, Martin took over as Martin Johnson took over as captain, you know, and he is a formidable man. I mean, just phenomenal to be on the pitch with a little bit like Paul O'Connell, you know, playing alongside Paul in, in the Lions. He had a very similar sort of ilk to, to Martin Johnson, a way, a manner about him. Um, and and from that moment on, you know, so what would that have been? I would have been 20 for those next four years. It, literally didn't matter what the score was in a game if we were behind by 40 points you know we still believed we'd we'd come away and win the game and and that consistency of success led to the you know the the trophies that you've mentioned already we also had two league titles before the game turned professional and actually because of the monopoly we were having on the titles at that time you know the clubs 
when the uh, when the Premiership was brought in, the clubs all voted on whether uh, it should be, you know, a one-off Premiership final and a series of playoffs, or whether you should still keep the league system. Mm-hmm. And everyone bar Leicester <laughs> voted on uh, on uh, on the playoffs. And for the next couple of years, I think it was only us that that managed to win it when we finished top. Every other club, like Gloucester and various others, when they finished top, could never win the playoff game. So I wonder whether they questioned that. But it's a brilliant product now, isn't it? And and a remarkable time to reflect on when you think how how difficult it is to consistently win in this current game that we watch. And and it's brilliant, you know, the ball in play for as long as it is as well. Is I would have loved to play in the current in the current era. I miss it. You know, the collisions, the force, the intensity, but just the amount of handling the. T- time you get with ball in hand as well um yeah good good memories but i'd still love to be playing jim <laughs> i know i get that vibe off you lewis and uh, lewis i'm going to move on to england now and the effect of clive woodward because england were in terms of rugby there or thereabouts always talked up always hyped, hyped up coming into that obviously that fame and you made your debut in 2001 uh for england but that will be world cup season when you went there the sort of professionalism Clive took it to another level but for you as well to you were competing against Neil Back and Lawrence Delalio for your position on that sort of team as well so for you was the competition was almost England A versus England B matches in training were the ferocious I imagine and how did Clive bring that element of professionalism was it the in-house games that really took you to the next level? Well, Clive, first of all, you know, Clive, Clive was a brilliant manager. He was just exceptional. He really revolutionised that England team, you know, from the disappointment he had in the 99 World Cup and losing to South Africa in the quarterfinal at home. Um, it made a lot of changes, brought, you know, brought in an incredible coaching team, um, not just coaching team or the backroom staff, you know, chefs. There was there was just minute attention to, to detail. You know, the one percenters was always his you know, his catchphrase, you know, do everything 1% better rather than one thing 100% better. Um, and we just grew over over that next period. And I think, you know, having a side like the Tigers with Martin Johnson, obviously, as its captain and and Wasps with uh, Lawrence Delalio as its figurehead at that time, those two sort of clubs made the bulk of that England side at that time. So for me, coming in when training at, at Leicester Tigers was was more ferocious I think than than any other club in in the country and and was renowned for it you know we had more fights on the training ground uh, than we had anywhere and it was normally in the touch sessions which was always a bit weird but um it was it was just a you know it was a great breeding ground to prepare me for international rugby because when we then stepped up you know I was playing with international players week in week out whether it was England South Africa Australia New Zealand that were part and those first team v second team training sessions at Leicester and Phil Larder who was the defence coach at Leicester and also England you know prepared you for what was to come when you stepped up that next level on the international stage and um, and, and it, I absolutely loved it and it didn't feel like a big step at the time which sounds I hope it doesn't sound arrogant but I think just because of the preparation I'd had at Leicester with all those internationals around me it had already immersed me in that sort of attitude and behavior that was going to be needed um it took me took me time to to get bedded into that international team because there were so many brilliant back rowers around you know not only you mentioned Neil Back um Richard Hill and Lawrence Delaney you had Martin Corrie Joe Worsley uh Andy Hazel um James Forrester uh Alex Sanderson and Pat Sanderson. there was a lot of guys around that were pushing for places um and I think that is what drove the quality of that side in in 2003 that it wasn't just the back row that had that strength and depth every position you know could could um could count on the same you know whether one person the starting person stepped away or fell injured the next person they knew could come in and do a job and, and I think that was the beauty of that side was that we we completely bought into what Clive was was asking of us you know um, to be the fittest side in the world and to be the best prepared come that 2003 tournament. And and that's what we were. And it took a lot of graft and a lot of effort um, as winning always does or being successful always does. But, um, you know, if you didn't buy into it, then, you know, or you, you know, you weren't prepared to put in those extra yards then you, you fell by the wayside pretty quickly. So, you know, Clive should rightly take credit for a, for a huge amount of that success, but he was, he was supported by a brilliant team and, you know, Phil Arder, Andy Robinson and various other guys, and with Martin as captain, you know, Jono, it got to the point with Martin Johnson where 
you know, if the coaches just thought we needed to do more training, Jono knew inherently that if we'd done enough, he would say it and actually the coaches would listen and it wouldn't be because he couldn't be asked to do a bit of extra training. It's because he knew that that was the best point to stop the session. You know, we had worked tirelessly and we had, it was, it was finish on a high rather than on a low. Don't do a couple of extra rounds just because you need to, you know. Um, and I think once we got into that position where Jono was, you know, really not, not running the show, but in charge of training, um, to that degree we we knew we were in a strong position there and going in it just gave you huge amounts of confidence and i know lewis here in ireland uh we've beaten south africa we've beaten australia we've beaten new zealand in winter internationals and uh, in series but we've never done it in the world cup stage did he obviously as an england team he had done that as well coming into the world cup did you actually honestly a world cup environment believe that no, that she had beaten them, that she could take that sort of winning mentality into the World Cup. Did you not sort of fear them in that World Cup environment or something that had always happened to Ireland down through the years while we could beat these teams uh, in, in internationals come World Cup, there's some sort of apex or white mist or something. That didn't seem to happen with you guys. No, I, I, you know, I think it stemmed, I won't say it was because of the, the Leicester attitude, but because of our success at Leicester at the time, the seven... England internationals that, that were predominantly forwards that made up that side were used to winning. You had the Wasp side that were used to winning. Um, and then you sprinkle in some other stardust from the other clubs. You And and the, the games felt the same. In that England side from 2001 to 2003, I never, never thought or felt we were going to lose a game. We did, obviously, on, on the odd occasion, but... Um, I think we had a record, was it 16, 17 games without a loss? And we shouldn't have lost the game that we did. We lost by a point to the French. Um, but, you know, that sort of, uh, that that preparation and that mindset going into a World Cup, having beaten New Zealand, Australia, South Africa at Twickenham, having beaten New Zealand and Australia in their own backyard on that tour that summer in 2003, where, uh, you know, where the forwards held the Aussie eight with only six because I think Backy and Lawrence got a, or Backy and Hilly got, got yellow guarded. I mean, it just built that inner belief in the side and, and come the world cup a hundred percent having won the grand slam just previously. We felt that we were going to win. It wasn't, you know, and when, when we got past France in the semi final, I think to a man that squad felt, okay, now this is, you know, this is, now we're here. This is it. This is where we're supposed to be. There was no like jubilation about making the final like the team had in 2007, four years later, because we'd been so poor up until that point. No, we knew we were capable. We knew we needed to be there and should be contesting a World Cup final because we were the best side in the world at that time, ranked number one. And when we were finally there, it was just a case of getting it right on the night. And, you know, we almost we almost didn't. We probably squandered more points than the uh, well, we did. We squandered a lot of points that we should have. We should have had, and we probably should have put Australia to the sword. But you know, they were a good side on the night, and uh, and it proved a it proved a quality game. Uh, just one or two more things, Lewis, before I let you go. You're obviously involved in that final play that led to Johnny Wilkinson's uh, famous drop goal in terms of that line-out phase uh, before it. I suppose in terms of that, was it just in the heat of the moment? You're down. You need to start to scores in terms of that. Was it almost felt like just go through the normal phase, normal routine, and obviously get the ball into Johnny's hands, and Johnny will do the rest? Well, he'd done it for the rest of the tournament, so you know, um, I mean, I had a small part to play in in the final, um, uh, but I can never, I can tell you, I was never as nervous as I had been sat on the bench in uh, in that game. All the energy of being a a professional tells you I want to be on the pitch playing I can make a difference and then as the game sort of seesawed between a point here and there going into the dying moments then into extra time you start having to deal with all the gremlins you know worrying about being the person that comes on and gives away the penalty um, so as you as you learn to, to repress that sort of negative energy and the inner critic that starts talking to you um, when I got on the pitch and you crossed that white line your mindset is purely on just doing your job and and the brilliance of those last minutes and a half, and it wasn't a case of just going to the rhythm. Well it, well, it was and it wasn't. We fell into a pattern of play that we'd rehearsed a thousand times in training, but we'd also rehearsed, you know, 15 to 20 other patterns because Clive recognised when we knew we were, you know, we were moving to that number one spot, we'd beaten everyone, that we were the best side in the world and deserved to be in a final or could be in a final that 
he needed to figure out what it would take to win. And he went away and looked at all the other um, sporting finals, NFL, football, World Cup, cricket, et cetera, um, and, and tried to figure out what was the common denominator. And the common denominator more than any was that it came down to the last couple of minutes or, or a final play in the last couple of moments. So for months prior to the build-up, you know, prior to arriving in Australia, we spent months at the end of every session rehearsing possible outcomes of the ends of games. And wow. one of those was obviously, you know, we called it zigzag, was having the zigzag pattern to get Johnny in a position to kick a drop goal, you know, as well as numerous others. And on the night, you know, when we got under the post and Johnny said, right, Mudos, you're going to chase the kickoff. Uh, pressure Matt Rogers, hopefully he'll scuff it. We'll get the line out and we're going to zigzag. I mean, that was literally it under the posts when uh, Kitto kicked the, oh no, not Kitto. It was flatly, wasn't it? Kick the points. And, and uh, so so from that point onwards, actually there was no pressure really because you knew what you had to do and you're on the pitch doing your job. Um, but what I loved about it was the was the preparation that went into it, the calm clarity of thought from Jono under the post when you could be panicking and and our ability, I suppose, as a team to to finish, you know, you know, because it could have, it could have gone, it could have gone easily wrong. Um, but I had a role from Johnny's kick actually, which was to hold the width on the right-hand side of the pitch. So if all the Aussies gathered around that breakdown and tried to pressure Johnny, so he couldn't get his kick away, the, the get out option was me on that far right-hand wing. And if you've got the video, you can rewind it and see uh, as Neil Back's about to pass it, you see the commentator going, and this is the moment uh, we're going to drop for World Cup glory. And uh, I was waving my hands at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen because actually it was on, mate. It was my moment of World <laughs> Cup glory and Johnny stole it. <laughs> no, uh, look, that was perfect. Uh, Lewis, uh, sort of penultimate sort of question, second last one uh, now for you. 2007, the joy of winning the first World Cup to despair of losing that uh, rugby World Cup final to South Africa. I suppose a bitter sort of sweet moment on the field. And did you feel when when you, when you lost that World Rugby World Cup that the chances be be there for you to come back for another one? Uh, I don't think you think too far beyond the next game as a as a rugby player. You know, all I've always do is play for England. Then if I was good enough, play for my country uh, in a World Cup. Then if I was good enough to do that, play for the Lions. And you sort of move through those stages as and when they when they arrive and as and when you're good enough. So, you know, I, I don't know if I ever thought I'd get to play in a World Cup. I definitely didn't think I'd get to play in three. I definitely didn't think I'd get to play in two finals. Um, you know, so it was it's remarkable to look back on now. You because when you're in it, you're in the journey. You know, you're you're putting the yards in, you're preparing each week. Rugby's such a bubble and the emotions come thick and fast, but also the ability to change um, the outcome from week to week is is the joy of it, right? So you can have a shock at one weekend and then as long as you get picked, you get to rectify that the following weekend with a performance and a result. And and that's really how he lived. That's how I lived for, for a long time. And there's a wider goal and a bigger picture that you work towards if you're with England or the league or, you know, all the premiership titles. Yes, you know what those sort of goals are, but... Otherwise, you're working from week to week. So um, come the final in 07, I mean, you know, it was, we still had a huge part, you know, we had a huge squad of World Cup winners still in that side, you know, Johnny Wilkinson, Mike Catt, Lawrence, Martin Corey, Phil Vickery, who was the captain, um, Andy Gomesall, uh, Simon Shaw, Joe Ware. I mean, there was a load of us still, but we were playing awfully. And um, the beauty, the thing that I remember most um, fondly about that tournament was, that we made a final at all and how how we got there because we lost 36-0 to South Africa in the second game, which was a record defeat. And we were playing badly and there was no consistency and there was a lot of sort of negativity around the camp. And and after that session, it really brought the squad together. We sat down and, and I can't remember, you know, who who called it. Maybe it was the coaches. We had Mike Ford, John Wells, Graham Roundtree and... Um, and a couple of others at the time, Brian Ashton, who was head coach. And um, and we sat down, we just, we were honest with each other. We were just like, this is this is not good enough. What we're doing isn't working. Let's figure out what we need to do to make it work. And, and to John Wells and Graham Roundtree's credit, you know, they went away and did, did their analysis and said, right, we're playing the front. Well, these are the games we've got left. And this is what we're going to focus on. We can't suddenly reinvent the England side. We're just going to focus on one clear, specific target. All of us, that's it. That's our focus for the game. And once we'd, once we'd beaten Tonga and Samoa, it became the France, uh, sorry, it was Australia in, in the quarter 
and the focus was purely the breakdown. They hadn't had to contest or fight hard to win their own ball. Um, so we flooded the breakdown. And, you know, we, there's no way we should have won that game on form. You know, we were awful in comparison to Australia, who'd been scintillating. But we had a singular focus and were galvanised by the frustration of how we'd been playing and, and the coaches calling us out. Um, so for me, the, the joy of making it to a semi, beating France in their own backyard at the Stade de France, you know, again, singular focus was to pressure the kickers. They'd scored the majority of their points through drop goals and free kicks and penalties. So give away, give them no easy points and pressure every drop goal. You know, so a lot of that fell on my head, which I quite enjoyed. And then the, the final, do you know what? I don't remember what the focus was for the final, which maybe tells us something, but I, I enjoyed getting there you will maybe find this strange and I hope this doesn't come across in the wrong way, but I remember standing on the pitch when we'd lost in the final thinking, do you know what? These guys deserve to win. And if we'd won, maybe, maybe it would undermine the, the result we'd had four years ago because I didn't feel like we were the best side at the world cup, but I felt like we'd come, we were, we were the team that had come together the tightest to get through what we needed to do to get to that position. And, and it was almost, reaching the final was winning the final in itself, you know, for that group of players at that time. Um, and I hope that doesn't, I hope that comes across in the right, the right way because I wouldn't want anyone to listen and think that I didn't appreciate or be, or that I was disappointed to lose in a final, which I was, but it, it felt right at that time that, you know, that South Africa won. And finally, Lewis Moody, time is caught up with us. The final two sentences, if you'd summarise Lewis Moody as a rugby player that's throughout his career, looking back on him, what would you like those two sentences to read? Uh, sentences, I could probably, I don't know, I could probably sum it up in a... that he was dedicated to his teammates and, and passionate, passionate about the game. Passionate about the game. Lewis Moody, uh, an MBE, a two-time Rugby World Cup finalist, a four-time, five-time winner of the, the Premiership uh, with, with Leicester Tigers, four in a row, two-time Heineken Cup finalist, uh, 71 appearances, 45 uh, uh, points for England, the 2005 British-Irish line as well. Lewis, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to speak to us on this episode of Global Rugby Legends. Thank you. Your pleasure, mate. Take care, Jim. Thank you.